My name is Yasar Jarlar, and I will be with you throughout the one and a half hours as we hear some very interesting insights on our topic of the day, which is a global conversation. Our conversation today is about rethinking and reimagining the core of government after this crisis that we have all lived and still living. Major crises cause major consequences. A lot of these consequences are unforeseen. But today we want to reflect slightly on the longer term. We want to see what the impact of this crisis will be on government. What are the changes that will stick? What are the innovations that have helped us get through this? But what did this also help us think through? What are the major challenges that governments have lived? How did they deal with them? And we're looking at the core of government. We're not looking at fringe applications and quick solutions at the heart of the government machinery, how this has transformed that. And we have a fantastic uh, panel of speakers who will be joining us today. If you want to engage on social media, if you want to mention the webinar, some of the ideas, here are some hashtags you can use, hashtag MBR innovation or hashtag Ibtakir. For the non-Arabic speakers, Ibtakir means innovate. And we have the at, at MBR innovation uh, uh, tag as well. At the end of today's webinar, we will also do a quick poll to hear your thoughts and um, your reflections on some of the ideas you've heard. If you have any questions and you would like to pose them to some of our speakers and panelists, please do uh, send them through the, uh, the channels on Zoom. And we will try to accommodate a few of them because as you can see, from this fantastic agenda we have today, that we have seven uh, great speakers, practitioners, thought leaders. I will introduce each one as the time comes. Um, and I will not go through long bios, but if you do the maths of one and a half hours, seven great speakers, you can see how much time we have for each. This is gonna be a high octane, high paced uh, thought leadership session with a lot of practices, a lot of cutting edge thoughts. So we will be open to continue the conversation on the Ibtakir platform for the Mohammed bin Rashid Center for later. But before we kick off with our panelists and speakers, we have a few words to welcome everybody and just to set the scene probably for this topic we are about to discuss. And I would like to invite the team to run a, a few words by Jeffrey Schlagenhoff, the Deputy Secretary General of the OECD, who's reflecting on public governance in these difficult times and some thoughts to set the scene for our conversation today. Mesdames et Messieurs, I'm delighted to be part of this webinar on reimagining the core of government after COVID-19. I would like to thank the Global Innovation Council for the invitation to address you today. Who would have thought at the beginning of the year that we'd be where we are today? The past few months have been a remarkable and difficult time for governments across the world as they were forced to adapt and to respond to the coronavirus crisis. Governments will remain under pressure for the foreseeable future as this crisis and its aftershocks continue to unfold. The OECD estimates that the impact of business closures could result in reductions of 15% or more in the level of output in advanced and major market economies with serious consequences for the job market and the welfare of individuals in societies. Yet for all of the terrible negatives and very real costs, the crisis can also give us important insights into the state of our societies. It can reveal and magnify what we may have not noticed, what we may have forgotten. This particular crisis has already revealed many important issues and I just want to take the time to highlight two of them. First, public governance really, really matters. Whether it is about responding to the urgent imperatives of containing a pandemic, creating the conditions for recovery, or rebuilding the capacity to absorb future shocks, it is clear that effective government is essential. When it comes down to it, it is government that it eventually provides the safety net for all of our societies and economies. This is a mission that we cannot fail in. Second, the public sector is capable of extraordinary things. Through the OECD's 
Innovative Responses Tracker, we have captured over 350 examples of innovative responses to the crisis. Some might be really small things, such as the state of California temporarily providing marriage licenses online. Others look to be longer term, using the crisis to question some of the basics of how we work. For example, the government of Canada's transport ministry has announced that the default policy for its staff will be to work for home for the foreseeable future. These and many other examples demonstrate that governments can and do innovate, even if sometimes it requires a crisis to clear hurdles that are inherently there in terms of how bureaucracies work. So it can say the government matters and that it can clearly innovate. The question is then, how can we ensure that government works well, not only under the current crisis circumstances, but that we are investing in innovations and new approaches that will be needed to prepare for any future shocks? How can we ensure the government is ready for and help shape the changing world? Reimagining government is more important than ever. And I commend the Global Innovation Council and the government of the UAE for convening today's discussion on the topic. The OECD, its Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, and the UAE have been longstanding partners in advancing innovative approaches that build resilience and adapt, adapt, adaptation excuse me, at the core of the state to respond to the short and long-term challenges society is facing. I look forward to continuing this fruitful partnership and to promote public sector innovation. Thank you for the opportunity to join you. So just we reflected um, on a few points that, you know, one point we all secretly believe in at the Global Innovation Council is governments can innovate and they do innovate. But I think he posed the question is, do we, do we need a crisis for this innovation to take place? Um, and then uh, I think one of the points that he mentioned is how can, we, how can we make sure that this crisis doesn't go to waste? How can we make sure that some of the things we're thinking about now and the changes we're doing in government will make governments future ready to withstand future shocks? And I would think also to be able to exploit future opportunities. So I'm going to invite Yuha. Yuha Lepanen is the chief executive uh, of uh, Demos Helsinki. And Yuha, your, your work is on accelerating uh, social societal change, particularly in government. Um, and now in this COVID-19 crisis, how much opportunity do you see uh, for ex you know, accelerating this change we all aspire to see in government to make it more responsive, innovative, and, and closer to what we want to see by way of creating public value? Thank you so much, Dr. Yasser. It's a very, very good question. I see enormous opportunity for that. Uh, governments around the world have innovated uh, on different topics and different issues for the past decades. And with COVID-19 now, we do have actually a chance to accelerate change, not from on the fringes of governments, but in the core of governments. And this is, of course, a very, very inspiring topic. Next, please. So, before we go to the topic of how COVID-19 can actually accelerate the change in the core of governments, let's reverse back a few months. Uh, during the spring, our world has changed. Our societies, our ways of living, our ways of working have all changed enormously. As citizens, what we've started to do, we've started to look out for leadership. We've started to look out for guidance. We've started to look out for security. We've started to look out for things that mainly only governments can provide. During the spring, governments have come to the fore of our attention. We've turned the governments into the center, and we've started to expect much, much more from, the, from governments uh, while that has been done. Next, as the crisis prolongs, uh, we are increasingly starting to ask how and what does COVID-19 world look like? We're starting to ask questions on how our economies will look like, what happens to traveling, uh, what happens to our everyday uh, way 
practice of life and living. And we're starting to ask whether we return back to the normal or whether we leap forward to a new normal. I think in regards to which will be the priorities when we come out from, post, uh, from COVID-19 uh, pandemic, a very, very safe bet is an issue of governance. Next, we will be talking a bit more what that means in practice. On governance, uh, the first uh, attention uh, in the public debate was very, very much about individual policies. Which type of restrictions we put in place? How do we guarantee the safety, healthy, and security of citizens in our societies? We started also discussing economic stimulus packages, specific policies, responses to a very, very acute situation caused by COVID-19. Yet, when we move forward, we're actually increasingly starting to discuss about governance. Instead of focusing only on specific policies, which of course should be done, we're also discussing on how can we build a system of tracing that is legitimate and provides support and a sense of security for individuals and communities alike. We're starting to discuss how can we actually integrate scientific insights and evidence into policy making and political decisions and we're increasingly starting to discuss uh, which type of collaboration should we have on a local level on a regional level and uh, of course globally as well so the focus after the first shock is increasingly now turning from individual policy responses into a wider topic of governance and how we actually as societies next we'll be taking a quick look in terms of how that could be done and the answer is here, and this comes back to the question you posed, Dr. Yasser, in the beginning as well. What we need to do is turn innovation that has previously perhaps happened on the fringes of government. We have a variety of new ideas, new experiments, new approaches, new innovations in governments around the world. Uh, and now what we need to do is to start to look at how those innovations could be brought into the center of governments. And this is in the core of the mandate of the Global Innovation Council as well. How can we change the principles, the capabilities, the processes and functions of governments and utilize the power of innovation in each of those? This is something that is not easy. If it would be easy, it would have been done already. But yet at the same time, it poses uh, an imperative for everyone here and for every one of us in terms of how it could be achieved. So how to move from innovation previously happening in different phases sporadically into the core. How do we change our policy making? How do we change our budgeting? How do we change which are the priorities for governments in the 21st century? Next, we'll be taking a bit of a look into how the century will develop. As said, COVID-19, the pandemic we've been living with during the spring, will not be the final crisis of the 21st century. We still have a variety of different crises to deal with. We have climate change, we have in, uh, inequality globally, we have a variety of crises that governments need to take a proactive stance in solving and give us guidance in terms of the direction towards we want to go. More importantly, the 21st century will be a century during which societal transformation becomes a focal point in all of the actions of governments. This is something that for many governments that have been focusing on stability is something that comes as a new imperative to deal with. And this is exactly the issue to which we need to start finding uh, new solutions towards. Fortunately, COVID-19 has pushed us forward. COVID-19 is the perfect wake-up call for governments around the world. And next, we need to put this, these practice round learnings into practice and reality. Uh, in the core of government around the world. Next, we'll be taking a bit of a look in terms of what COVID-19 actually then caused. What we saw in the first phase was governments adapting, reacting to the crisis. We saw a variety of new policies, innovative initiatives, as already provided uh, in the video uh, creating as well. Uh, we've seen many new approaches that many governments have been struggling to push forward in the past decades that now during the spring have come into reality in a very very short and rapid period of time yet at the same time there are multiple questions that post covid governments have to be able to ask they are as following how to lead societal transformation 
amidst overlapping changes. How to balance various types of policy priorities holistically. How to introduce innovative approaches systematically across government functions. These are not easy questions, they are difficult ones. Yet at the same time, these questions are questions that governments have to solve in order to be successful in the 21st century. Finally, what we'll be focusing here today next is exactly this question. The question of government governance, the question of how to bring innovation into the core of governments. What we'll do here, we'll listen to governments. We try to underst understand through different uh, speeches and uh, talking points on what kind of governance vulnerab vulnerabilities have been highlighted uh, by COVID-19 and what needs to change in the core government. So this is the perspective of practitioners uh, and government uh, leaders in terms of how and what have we learned with COVID-19. What we'll do then is we'll listen to innovators which, uh, which COVID-19 induced government responses have the most potential? Which elements should be carried from this period uh, of crisis to post-COVID world and post-COVID societies? And then of course, the key in the end is to identify ways forward. What needs to change in the core of government and how do we get there? Thank you very much. I'll be looking forward to the discussion here. Thank you, Juha, for these points and uh, for starting us off with a lot of food for thought. Um, more crises are coming ahead for sure in the 21st century. How can governments cope with these? Um, and this whole idea of COVID being a force multiplier. COVID-19 has been bad for on many levels, but on some levels in government, it's been a force multiplier for thinking through some of the stuff we've always wanted to improve government with. Um, and we already have some questions coming through. I'm not going to attempt to answer them, uh, and I'm going to pull in uh, uh, another distinguished speaker now with us, but please, if you do have any questions and you want to pause them, mention the country you're in so we get some context around that. We've got questions coming in for our wonderful speakers around, you know, how can we engage more crowdsourcing? How can we, what other measures other than GDP can me measure us and so on. But to let, to comment on Yuha's talk and to open, to, to widen the conversation as well, I'd like to invite Marcus Monturi, who is Director for Public Governance at the OECD. Marcus, can you give us your thoughts on this very big and important topic, please? Yes, yes, sir. Thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity and, and thank you, Juha, for a very uh, uh, interesting uh, presentation. And, and, and I, I'm going to pick up by, by start, starting uh, by saying that if the crisis has shown anything, is, is it has shown very clearly the need for uh, an effective and efficient uh, public sector. Uh, if you really want to have uh, collective action by, by society as a whole, uh, you need you need uh, public sectors to play an important role as a catalyst, of course, bringing all the different actors together, but even also sometimes as an arbiter of, of the different interests in society. Uh, uh, one thing that is very important, and, and we have noticed this by looking at, at the examples of countries around the world, is, is an essential element for the government to play that role is trust. Uh, governments who have uh, benefited from, from a high level of trust from its citizens were much more effective in their response than, than governments that uh, perhaps had the lower levels of, of, of trust. Um, but we, we, we're looking at uh, different examples uh, of, of responses at national level, at the local or, or regional level. And, and, and we're seeing very clearly that, that um, uh, lots of things went wrong. Uh, and, and maybe we can even learn more from those things that went wrong than from the things that went, went right. Um, very uh, many countries or many, many regions were, were caught off guard. Uh, they were not prepared enough. So, so initial preparedness uh, is definitely uh, an issue there. Uh, maybe linking that to, to the capacity of these countries to, to have uh, efficient foresight exercises. Uh, uh, and, and, and efficient risk management policies. And, and I think that, that some, some problems we've had are linked to, to, to that. Um, we have also, the, the crisis highlighted a number of issues, uh, problems uh, on procurement, on budget processes, on regulatory processes. I mean, I, I don't want to make a long list here, but, but we, we're learning a lot uh, uh, about the things, with the things that went wrong. But some things went right. Uh, some things went right. 
uh, many countries were able to show an amazing amount of flexibility in the policy response. Uh, and, and, and if you look at, uh, and, and Jeff, uh, our Deputy Secretary General has mentioned this, a number of examples that we have been uh, accolading uh, uh, at the OECD. Um, in terms of service delivery, in terms of working arrangements, a number of other areas, even on regulatory uh, policies, there has been an amazing amount of flexibility. And, and this is a very positive uh, side. I think we hopefully we can learn from it uh, uh, going forward. Uh, and, 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 and one point that is very interesting to see if you look at those, all those innovative practices is that this is something that did not happen by accident is because the countries were able to invest in innovation, innovative solutions and space uh, for, for innovation. Those are the ones who are able to respond more flexibly uh, uh, to, to the crisis. So I think the, the, the main things that I'd like to leave you with here uh, and, and building on what Yuha has said, um, uh, one of the very first things that, that we can already very clearly say if we think in terms of medium to long term, the countries that have created that space uh, for, for innovation uh, within the public sector are the ones who are better able to respond to the crisis. Uh, uh, the, the crisis, of course, can serve as a catalyst to, to move countries in, 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 in looking at uh, how to increase that space. And that's what we'll be looking at uh, at the OECD, how to help countries draw the right lessons uh, and increase that space uh, uh, for, for innovation in a more systematic way. Uh, the, the, the space for experimentation, the space for making mistakes. I think that's definitely something that, that uh, we'll be looking at uh, and, and, and seeing uh, uh, how can we ensure building on uh, our capacity for foresight, uh, on, on risk management, to, to create that necessary space uh, to, first of all, help recover from the crisis. The crisis is not over. The health crisis is not over. Uh, we have, of course, the economic crisis, the social crisis. Hopefully, this will not morph into into other types of crises. But but this is not over. So so we are in, still in the period of we are managing the aftermath of the of the, the the health crisis. But but it's very important that we start drawing the right lessons uh, that that we need to create space for innovation. And, and the second main important lessons that I think, coming back to the issue of collective action, collective action, I would say is most efficient if it is global. Uh, and, and, and another thing that, that uh, I would like to plead for is that as we move ahead into the next phase of, of this crisis management, that we increase the space for international cooperation and coordination uh, in, uh, in, in facing the, the, the aftermath of the crisis. I think this was, I would say, left something to be desired uh, in the first phase, maybe understandable, but, but there were definitely some problems there. And I think one, as, as we look ahead, let's, let's uh, try to, to focus also uh, on, on how the mechanisms to, to ensure that we have sufficient uh, international cooperation and coordination as we continue to, to, to manage this crisis. Thank you very much, uh, Yasser. Thank you, Marcos. This is a, this is a, a brilliant set of notes because I think you first of all you you you, you confirmed what the notes that you how was sharing that we've moved from response to rethinking the core of the design. But I think you mentioned the importance of governance and government in these days. We go through this cyclical nature of you know when times are good we want smaller governments get government out at the market and when things when bad things happen bring government back solve all our problems and 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 help us with with a lot of things. So it's unbelievably important because you mentioned. You know, my key takeaway is those who made some space for innovation, those governments who invested in the capabilities and the environment were better able to respond when things went bad. So that's a very big takeaway for all of us. And the second big takeaway, I think, is this need for collective action. This need for rethinking not just governments and local governance by way of cities and states, but this need for global governance. And, you know, beyond COVID-19, which will hopefully pass soon, we've got issues like climate change and so many other issues around the world who will benefit a lot from this ability to improve collective action. So again, thank you so much, Marcus. There's a lot of questions coming in. Again, I'm going to leave them until the end to see what I'll pull you back in with you in the interest of time, because I want to move into our interactive discussion now with our first panel. And, and we have two very distinguished speakers who are practitioners, 
in their governments in the United Arab Emirates and in Canada, who, uh, unlike me, as an advisor from the outside, have lived through the thick of this as, as officials in the government. And I want to ask both of them, and I will introduce them uh, 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 individually, but I want to ask both of them, what kind of governments will arise from this? Uh, what are you seeing from your vantage point on the front line, the changes, like maybe you have mentioned at the core, that will change the fabric and the look of government? First, I'm going to invite Huda Al-Hashimi, the Assistant Director General for Strategy and Innovation in the Prime Minister's office in the UAE. And then moving forward, I will invite Rod Ghali, the Assistant Secretary to the Cabinet, focusing on impact and innovation uh, in the Government of Canada. So, Huda, can you take us through some of your initial thoughts on what kinds of governments will arise post the pandemic? Are we witnessing the birth of a new, uh, a new machinery of government uh, from, your, uh, from where you sit? Um, thank you, Dr. Yassar. It's an honor for me to be here today with you all. It is without a doubt one of the most interesting periods of time that we are experiencing for the past few months. No futurist can claim that to have predicted this and no futurist can claim to know what will come next. Some nations are currently planning for and moving to recovery, whereas other nations are still in the midst of the peak. But what we all have in common is that this crisis has not spared any nation in the world. True, there are many scenarios that are put in place and are currently being planned and studied, from hoping to a V-shaped recovery, to hearing about the long-winded U and W shape. All of these terminologies have somehow become very familiar to us all and not just reserved to economists. We are really in a new and long journey with some ups and downs. And the question I think that's been posed by the other speakers today is that how can we learn from this journey? And how do countries and governments cope while being overwhelmed with managing the crisis at the same time? During such times of uncertainty, the attention of all populations turns towards their governments to take them through the storm. People are waiting for answers, for directions, and for clarity. The expectations of governments has definitely risen more than before. So now we must ask ourselves, which discussion is, what kind of governments will arise from this pandemic? We are witnessing today a global shift in government models, how they operate and how they function. The role of governments post COVID-19 is bigger, more challenging, more complex, and the expectations by the people are rising. All eyes are now focused towards innovation, governance, and the massive changes that will take place in the public sector. The virus has also pushed many governments to the edge, to be more adaptive, proactive, and innovative. The UAE has always sat at the intersection of global change and upheaval. Couple that with the drive to accelerate our growth, we quickly recognize that we would have to do things differently. That hasn't been the case because of COVID. That's always been the case since the inception of the country. Uh, we are always trying to push the boundaries of what is possible. And we have an ambitious 50-year vision, a vision that cannot be achieved with traditional approaches to government. Our citizens and residents are globally connected and we have to be able to meet all their expectations. And this requires a government that excels. The global pandemic was a strong wake up call to all. It has given birth to many opportunities to improve the way government functions. Here in the UAE, we sought to take advantage of those opportunities by changing the way we operate in government and by using this crisis to build a stronger future government that is more capable, more efficient, more resilient, more agile, and more innovative. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Huda. And that's a, a brilliant uh, segue. I want to ask the same question probably before I have some questions from my side and some questions popping up on the discussion as well. Rodney, you want to give us some of your reflections on what's, what's arising by way of new government in, in Canada from this experience? Great. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. And I'm, um, yeah, I'm definitely going to reflect on, I think, some of the comments that Huda just made in terms of her country experience. So uh, I'll just start by saying it's a real pleasure to be here uh, with all of these esteemed colleagues and talk about the Canadian experience uh, thus far uh, in managing the COVID crisis. So uh, just as a bit of context setting um, so that people can appreciate sort of our operating environment. I think as people know, uh, you know, Canada is a mid-sized country, about 37 and a half million citizens. Um, we, um, we operated in a federated model, which means we have a national and then a subnational uh, governance system. From a COVID standpoint, uh, you know, we're probably sort of midway in the pack right now in terms of managing this crisis. We've got about 100,000 uh, cases with, unfortunately, a number uh, approaching 8,000 sort of deaths. And so we uh, continue to sort of manage uh, in a very sort of diligent and concerted way. Uh, and we are sort of on the cusp of uh, very much sort of flattening the curve for this, uh, for this first wave. And so what I really want to focus on 
I think just in some of my opening remarks are two sort of major uh, themes in terms of how we have fundamentally changed um, two sort of key tenets of how government has been working. Uh, first on governance itself, and then second in the policy making and implementation perspective. And so from a governance standpoint, uh, we have operated um, under a Westminster style of government for the last 152 years with a very strong sort of departmental and ministerial accountabilities. Um, those structures rapidly evolved and changed as the crisis started to unfold. And what we saw was sort of number one, a collapse of our traditional cabinet structure into one that was very much focused on a new um, ad hoc cabinet committee um, that was chaired by our deputy prime minister um, with key ministers as part of that, that fed into the prime minister and sort of our full cabinet. We also saw a collapse in our deputy minister structure. And so these are senior leaders within the federal government that are not elected, um, but the heads of all of our departments. And that also sort of collapsed into uh, one decision-making uh, and information sharing um, uh, body that was chaired by our deputy clerk, who is the um, second most senior official within government. And then thirdly, from a governance perspective, uh, what we saw was um, a rapid sort of integration of the national and subnational governments. And so from a federal, provincial, territorial standpoint, what we had traditionally seen prior to COVID were sort of annual or semi-annual gatherings of our prime minister, first ministers, and others. Um, uh, and uh, post-COVID or during sort of, sorry, this COVID crisis, we are now having sort of weekly meetings um, uh, between the prime minister and uh, and his counterparts uh, across the government. And so this is um, sort of a phenomenon that, you know, certainly was precipitated by this crisis. We have seen similar, uh, I think, shifts uh, in previous pandemics and, and sort of previous structures, but nothing uh, to the scale or sort of magnitude in terms of a shift in our governance structures. And so the consequence of that from a policy development and implementation standpoint, I think has been equally um, um, sort of groundbreaking. And so not unlike, I think all uh, countries across the world, we have seen uh, governments um, very rapidly, both on the health side and the economic side. And so on the health side, uh, obviously that has been sort of the first focus of attack in terms of trying to keep the infection at bay. Uh, and under control, that has caused some very significant, as everyone knows, um, economic uh, consequences at a, as economies have shut down globally um, and have had some very significant sort of impacts uh, in Canada itself. What that has meant is, um, as other speakers have talked about, is the role of government taking on a very sort of strong economic um, uh, role and we have seen packages both sort of on the economic and sort of social benefit side roll out in the tens of billions of dollars in uh, a matter of days or weeks. You know, pre-COVID, uh, the decision-making process to develop these policies would have taken months or years, uh, and we didn't have the luxury of sort of months or years, so we saw rapid development of policy, and most interestingly, um, I think in the rapid development and the implementation of those policies are were uh, this idea that the policies were announced, um, parameters were announced, um, and uh, we saw once again sort of rapid sort of change of parameters of those policies as they started to uh, move into implementation. And I can get into details of what those would be on some of the social benefit programs and others, uh, but just to demonstrate that unlike in traditional ways of working, where policies are thought out uh, very sort of carefully and sort of all the parameters are thought out. We didn't have the luxury of that, but we were able to sort of iterate uh, during the implementation phase. Um, and so that is in and of itself, I would say sort of a groundbreaking innovation, um, both from government and a citizen standpoint. And then certainly from an, uh, an experimentation and an innovation standpoint, uh, Canada, I think had uh, the benefit of uh, in very strong sort of investments in systematic sort of infrastructures on the innovation and experimentation sort of side over the last at least four years, um, if not certainly before that. Uh, and what we were able to see were um, sort of the rapid deployments of uh, some of the key skill sets that we had developed um, in previous mandates uh, fully focused on COVID-19 responses. And so even if I look at my own team, 
uh, within the Privy Council office, which in essence is the Prime Minister's department, we had sort of rapid deployment of our behavioral scientists uh, looking at how to ensure that we can start moving forward on behaviorally informed interventions to help sort of shore up our public health measures. Um, also behavioral scientists working on sort of new data collection tools and approaches um, uh, to help sort of understand sort of citizens' behaviors, um, um, uh, nuances as the pandemic was unfolding. And then obviously um, the unconventional thinking that sort of our team and other teams have had across government who were very well steeped in innovation and experimentation, applying these unconventional lenses to um, uh, short-term sort of measures that are taking place right now, as well as some of the medium-term and post-COVID measures that the government is thinking about. So overall, um, I would say some very rapid um, and uh, at times sort of seismic shifts in both governance and policy from a Canadian perspective. Well, thank you so much. That's a, a, an excellent uh, tour de force of the, some of the, uh, the, the key actions. And, and I have a couple of follow-up questions, as I'm sure many, in fact, some of the questions are rolling in to the point where somebody is asking, when will the pandemic end? I will not burden you with that answer, but I would like to go back to Huda. Huda, you mentioned uh, something about us learning new skills. We've all had to adapt with data, looking at, you know, we've all become economists. Um, we're learning exponentially as governments, as we speak. I think there's been a, an exponential increase in people looking at exponential curves this, this period. But what are the main lessons you learned uh, through this very condensed period? I mean, not all countries are going through the same phase, but a lot of countries are learning from each other. One of the things we're trying to do as the GIC and this webinar is to exchange knowledge. So what, what lessons would you learn having gone through the past four months? What do you think that, how can you pinpoint the top things you've learned that you can share uh, by way of addressing this from within government? Thank you, doctor. So, uh, so when COVID-19 came, I think no doubt it came as a shock to all of us. It did though confirm our thinking regarding the importance of governance, innovation, and agility. So we were fortunate that the UAE had an edge because our, of our early adoption of this thinking. Rather than being reactors, it proved that this is no longer a choice to adopt, but actually a need. So, which is why uh, the UAE government's response to COVID was a result of our leaders having this mindset to begin with and leveraging that all in key decisions we have to undertake. So if I was to bundle really four main areas for the sake of time, and there, some of them are quite similar to what Rodney was mentioning in the Canadian example. So the first one is the, is the need and the, and, the, and the fact that we did bulk policies and regulations through a very fast track approach. This was not the time to have normal uh, timelines and no normal procedures. This was where bold decisions had to happen quite soon. So the UAE, like many other governments, took historic and unprecedented precautionary measures, such as implementing lockdown, putting in curfews, airport closures, retail closures, social distancing, other measures. We are now actually, and thankfully, at the stage of doing the opposite, and that is slowly having measures of opening up our economy and going back to work. So these are also very, uh, very uh, strong things. Um, additionally, the government had to issue a number of emergency decisions in various sectors, such as temporary hospitals being built in a in, in couple of days, uh, postponing uh, some, uh, some taxes and fees and fines, distance learning for the whole of schools in, 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 in a matter of a day to ship the whole uh, children, 1.2 um, million of our children to, um, to homeschooling. These weren't decisions that we actually debated on. We actually uh, moved quite quickly on. So almost, and, and another strong one, which I think my colleague Dr. Abderrahman will be talking a bit more about, is, is the shifting of all the workforce in government. 95% of our jobs went remotely. The government did not stop. So roughly, uh, we adopted around 250 measures of policies and regulations during a period of just March and May. This is totally unprecedented in, in any uh, timeline. The other key learning was the importance of having parallel teams and working in an agile way. This is where the shift in governance took place. So one of the teams that was very early on was created was a task force to work on the stimulus at the federal level. In addition to the formation of nine committees and special work streams, uh, teams from the Council of Ministers to ensure business in the community. But interestingly, we also had in parallel another task force created at the same time working on post-COVID-19. And that was uh, literally at the beginning of March. So we're talking about at the early stages of the crisis, these parallel teams were created together. Uh, so that our focus in government was not just in terms of the 
current crisis, but also looking at what would life look like post uh, the crisis. So the, the, those two teams that then merged together, and that's where the state that we're at now. But the post-COVID team was looking at key challenges, global trends, will, what global trends will occur, developing opportunities and strategies for life in the UAE post-COVID. And last month, we organized a three-day virtual strategy leadership meeting, which our prime minister led, and almost 100 of our key leaders participated, along with global experts, to discuss this framework. The third learning, in which echoes, I think, the, the message that we heard from the OECD, is the encouragement of documenting innovations quite quickly and sharing it quite uh, openly. And during these times, we witnessed many innovations that were launched by different local and federal governments, such as virtual courts, uh, AI in supporting remote education, robots and drones for sterilization and control, several digital applications to monitor the spread of the virus, and telemedicine and mental health campaigns. All of these were captured and documented as key studies very early on and spread through our ethical platform so other governments could benefit from this because as rightfully said, the crisis is not over. People are still wanting to learn to know what other tactics and other uh, areas that we could actually uh, use as, as solutions to the challenges we're facing. Maybe the fourth thing and probably the last thing that I wanted to share is in terms of the digital readiness. Nothing stopped when the crisis came. Our leadership's foresight on investing in smart learning program and smart government e-services can considerably contributed to ensuring business continuity. A unified national contract, uh, contact center for government services was launched and more than 3 million services were provided during the month of March alone. This is an increase of 173% of the 2019 rate. So utilizing over 2,400 digital government services that were already in place prior to the virus. These are some of the key learnings that, that I wanted to share in terms of the UAE, but I'm sure there are more, but for the sake of time, I'll, I'll leave it to that. Thank you, Huda. These are very valuable lessons, and I think they highlight a couple of things. One is you mentioned the readiness, that the UAE was ready in many ways because of the investment made over the past five years. And I know every government around the world and my colleagues from government can say, vouch to that probably. When you make these investments, and we had a question about investments moving forward. When you make these investments, sometime people don't see the immediate value of saying maybe this is a little bit too much, why do we need so much technology? But when things like this happen, you find a huge gap between those who invested and were ready and those who didn't invest. And that's an answer to a question that was posed about do we continue to invest moving forward? Uh, Rodney, I want to bring you in on a couple of things you've mentioned here because you said you know, something about rapid, rapid uh, policy making. I could have mentioned how fast decisions were being done. Um, and, and we all think that's a positive thing, not because of COVID, just it's positive for governments to move a little bit faster than we're used to. How much of this would, be, uh, would become business as usual moving forward? Is it just a fast track for COVID? Is it something you're waiting to finish and stop doing and go back to normal? That's one question. Another question that came through, and I think you shed some light on it, so maybe if you can answer both in three minutes, this local and national uh, issue divide. How do you make sure that the local levels, whatever the unit of governance, and I know Yorit has a lot to say on that as well, how did you tackle that? And will it also, what, how much of all these good things will stick? Well, so I, th I think you're asking some of the, I, I guess, the, the primordial or, or key questions uh, coming out of this. And I think this is always um, uh, the key question that we ask during sort of a crisis situation and then, and then what, will, what will stick sort of afterwards. Um, uh, to ensure that we take the best of what has come of a, out of a very, um, I think, kind of difficult situation. So, I mean, with respect to the policy development uh, and implementation process, so, I mean, my short answer is obviously yes, I hope that there are aspects of this way in which we are working right now that will hold and stick. Um, it's unrealistic to think that uh, across every single policy domain um, and every single sort of instance that we will see this process unfold in the exact same way that we're seeing it now, um, given that this process is really being obviously focused on sort of the key um, issues that are at play right now, whether it's uh, ensuring that we have the, the right sort of social infrastructure in place to ensure that our citizens remain uh, well supported, obviously on the economic side, that we have the right sort of measures in place. And so we can't see that sort of across the board, but I think what we can sort of imagine is uh, a scenario where um, we have a much more sort of, I, I guess I would say sort of deliberative process that we have seen sort of up until now, one that sort of cuts across 
at least in sort of our instance, sort of these traditional Westminster style um, uh, boundaries that have, I think, at times held us back. And sort of the flip side is take a more whole of society approach uh, in terms of how that has unfolded. And I think most importantly, and it's something that, you know, a number of us have been championing across government for quite some time, which is this idea that um, obviously government doesn't have all of the answers. And then if you take sort of a multi-sectoral whole society approach uh, and you engage in a, in a very kind of different way that we have seen sort of up until now, um, in a few key areas, but we have certainly seen a spotlight shone on that within the COVID crisis. You actually get um, results far better than what you would have had. Um, and there is, um, I think the biggest learning coming out of this, it is a much more sort of, I guess, willingness on citizens to sort of accept the fact that there is, there are elements of imperfection that may come out sort of initially, um, but an absolute willingness on government to sort of address those imperfections as fast as possible to ensure that they are, they are shored up. And that is, uh, um, I guess, what I would say, part of the ethos that I am very sort of hopeful that we can maintain sort of post-COVID um, uh, to ensure that we have a much, a much stronger sort of democratic process um, uh, in the go forward. Really sort of briefly on that second question, as we talk about sort of different levels of government and how they can work uh, better together, once again, that is another sort of key issue that um, I think is always a challenge with any federated model of government when you have uh, sort of national and subnational governments. And in Canada, we have sort of the, the federal government, provincial governments, territorial, and sort of municipal. Uh, once again, we are all serving the same citizens at the end of the day. We have constitutionally different uh, roles that we play in all the policy issues. Um, and um, you know, obviously in times of crisis, there are aspects of work that will transcend politics. And I think that is sort of the aspiration that we have seen sort of come out of, you know, at the political level, sort of this rallying behind sort of the right ideas at the bureaucratic level, there have always been sort of good relations. Um, but at times it is hampered by sort of the the layers of bureaucracy. And so uh, once again, very similar into the, to, with respect to the comments I just made on policy development and implementation, my hope is that we will find sort of those positions where um, we can find, you know, the classic sort of ideas of shared value across governments, uh, recognizing that we are all in this to sort of maximize public good. Um, and there are, there are obviously sort of natural elements uh, that are nonpartisan and that we can move forward very quickly on those. And then of course sort of negotiate sort of elements that um, uh, may require sort of more uh, sort of negotiation, but that doesn't sort of, you know, obviously sort of hamper, I think, the, uh, the public good that we are all trying to accomplish. Brilliant, thank you very much, uh, Rodney, for that. Look, there's a lot of food for thought here and a lot of people coming in very hard and fast with questions. You're, uh, you you highlighted this importance of collective action, collective leadership, all of society. I think Marcus said we need collective uh, leadership at the national, international level. You're talking about the society level. There's questions coming in about engaging the citizens, crowdsourcing ideas. There's a challenging question saying how primed and ready the citizens are to accept this iterative process of policy of a trial and error, so to speak, without the existence of a crisis. And I hope we can come back and debate some of these issues if we have time, because these are very fundamental questions. But before we finish our chat and move on to the next panel, Huda, a couple of minutes, we have about two to three minutes to ask you a very big question. Within COVID and the UAE, in the UAE where you're sitting, you're talking about post-COVID and COVID will pass, you're looking at agility and agile governments. And I think all of us want to emerge from this as more agile governments. Uh, what are you putting in place? What thoughts do you have? And what's, what are the kind of advice you have for people in your position and for yourself to get to be a bit more agile moving forward and make some of these terms stick? Thank you, uh, Doctor. It's, uh, it's definitely a, a, a question that I would like to uh, elaborate more. But, but maybe before, maybe we go into sort of what does the agile government actually, it doesn't really have a direct translation in Arabic. It currently translates to the word marina which is flexibility, which is only one part of what agility means. Therefore, in the UAE, we define agility as advanced government. And that's how we see agility. It's about advancing everything that we do. It's about pushing boundaries. It's about embracing new methods and really accepting change without being limited to hard infrastructure, legislations, and systems that block change. It has innovation and experimentation really at its root. 
So my advice based on practical experience uh, would be to really, um, maybe at the beginning start small, but quickly build confidence in your coach. An example we have is uh, we kicked off a platform uh, called the Government Accelerators, uh, which embodies almost all of the characteristics of an agile framework. We started this over three years ago, and through the results, we built confidence in the approach. It used principles of, uh, strangely enough, but crisis mode, having short deadlines of 100 days and ambitious goals that needs to be implemented during the period. Short deadlines tend to create momentum and urgency. Also, we use the area of cross-sectorial collaboration in terms of bringing in those who are really at the forefront of the challenge. They're the ones that should be leading this. So no rigid hierarchies, bringing teams together, cutting all the bureaucracies, and giving them the autonomy to solve difficult problems themselves. And this is what I mean, them being private sector, government, academia, anybody who's really responsible for solving that, uh, that challenge. My other advice is to really to ensure that you have senior leadership support to rally government entities and individuals into the agile initiatives. You also really need to make space for agility and practice it. A percentage of your internal annual capacity could really remain unplanned. This is not something that we usually say in government, but actually consciously having a percentage of unplanned and leaving room for high priority projects and urgent needs. Over planning tends to kill creativity and the ability to identify new trends. So if our structure also is very rigid, it will take us a long time to change track of something spectacular comes our way or the next uh, unfortunate crisis. Another thing is to develop sources of up-to-date intelligence and live data so that policy and programs can be developed based on the needs of the moment. And this is it's actually proven so important now with COVID that live data is essential rather than waiting for backdated statistics. So all of this won't happen if we don't really entities to be more agile. So for example, in the UAE, we're working on a project to link agile indicators with incentives for entities and rewards. Our current government excellence program has now pivoted this year to celebrate and award those entities that have been most agile in managing COVID-19 as well. But to conclude, we realize now really that in the UAE, we must use this global crisis as a new opportunity to reset our goals. It's time now to treat agility not at the margins, but at the core so it can be part of our culture. Our change is driven by cabinet early on during the crisis. We are now going through an exercise of revising our strategies, relooking at all of our core government functions, policy, planning, governance, services, HR, and finance, and we're updating them to become more agile. This pandemic has especially highlighted the need for a new approach and to ensure readiness for the future. We should all not lose the opportunity to take advantage of this crisis to push through much needed reform. It should be, a sh in, in my opinion, it would be a shame to really go back to the normal way of, 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 uh, of, of key things that we take for granted, but instead we should be using and actively working on creating a new norm for the purpose of, of public good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Huda. Uh, thank you very much, Rodney. I think I would love to have to continue this conversation because Huda, you raised issues like the need for data and ability to manage data, which is probably fundamental these days. They need to be much faster in a system of government which we built to be slow and very sort of careful with our money and our lives. So, you know, this issue of more speed, less haste, there's a whole bunch of ways to think about how do you redesign the system. And I, I think as much as we enjoyed this conversation, I have to stop it here and I'll come back to you if we have questions at the end because we have three fantastic brains waiting to share their ideas. We had a bunch of questions coming up saying, can you share some specific tech, tech innovations or some specific actions that have been seen? Well, our next session is going to be all about, you know, what are the cutting edge innovations that are driving innovation in government today? So we're going to Somebody also mentioned something about remote work and HR. So I'm very happy to welcome again uh, today uh, Abdul Rahman Lawar, who's the Director General of the Federal Authority for Government Human Resources and was in charge of putting all government back home and then bringing them back online. Uh, Jeff Mulgan, who I think a lot of people would, would know from his great work in the UK government and uh, as a former CEO of Nesta and now at UCL. And uh, uh, somebody who I follow their work very closely, and I'm proud to say an old friend, Yorit De Young, who's a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and has a ton of experience uh, with many uh, innovations in governments for over two decades. Uh, gentlemen, uh, in the interest of time, one question. What are the cutting edge innovations that you have lived that you would like to share with us? I'm going to give you about three to five minutes to share your thoughts and then circle back with a question for each. And I'm looking for, and I will start by way of the agenda 
uh, structure, Dr. Abdul Rahman, please uh, share your thoughts with us. And I'll come to Jeff and Yorick after. Thank you, Doctor. And I really, uh, I'm honored to be part of this uh, panel, and I really learned a lot from uh, the discussion that I heard. So uh, to start with and to answer your question, uh, if you will excuse me, I will use one minute to echo some of the uh, thoughts that I heard from my colleagues. And, uh, and I apologize if the, if the audience will feel that they have heard this before, but I think this is a great indication that there is alignment uh, in terms of thinking and how uh, we're handling this uh, crisis and the learning out of it. Uh, for example, the response to crisis, I mean, nobody, could have anticipated, I mean, that there will be a crisis. We don't need to discuss that. But I think what we can discuss how entities or governments have varied uh, in response and how they responded to the crisis. And I think my colleague, Hudad Hashmi, and uh, I think Rodney have discussed how the governments uh, in the world, and particularly in the UAE and in Canada, were able to introduce agility and to adopt fast. Uh, likewise, I think there was an important element related to uh, have um, uh, consistency and uh, uh, a focused uh, approach uh, and across all sectors. And I believe this is very much uh, yeah, an, an example in the UAE. Uh, a third element maybe uh, uh, that differentiated governments and maybe entities that there are entities and governments who were seeking or trying to find and invent opportunities out of this crisis. And I think this is a key element that I will be discussing. And uh, uh, in, in the UAE government, what we have looked at is that uh, there, because of uh, the culture that was built into the government, uh, and, uh, and the UAE uh, has been uh, leading uh, in innovation in the government. And my colleague, Hudal Hashmi, leads actually the team in the Prime Minister's office uh, who looks after the innovation in the government. So all the entities were looking into this as part of their uh, practice and uh, strategy and uh, operation. And we saw, we thought that with this crisis, uh, very important opportunities have arisen. For example, the continuity of the business was a very important element to all governments, but uh, because of the investment that was made in the digital transformation of all the services, this was a very easily done in the UAE government. Um, uh, we are building on that, and I will be discussing maybe further examples of that. Secondly, uh, I believe uh, automation uh, is an important element, and, uh, and uh, automation was uh, a, a core of uh, focus in the government of the UAE. Pilots were kicked off. What this crisis have helped is basically accelerate these projects. So this is part of what the discussion and my previous calls were discussing, and uh, uh, likewise, the importance of measuring productivity. And uh, in the UAE, we have uh, the UAE government, and from a human capital point of view, I would like to uh, share the experience where we have actually, in 2019, pre-COVID-19 crisis, we didn't even know that there would be a crisis. Actually, a pilot was kicked off on using AI-powered productivity measurement solutions uh, across the, uh, I mean, in a pilot in over two entities in the federal government. Now, with uh, COVID-19, this became a great opportunity, uh, the opportunity to scale it up and to start using it uh, across the government. Uh, a third element, uh, maybe, uh, the uh, enhancing and upskilling the, the, the capabilities of our uh, uh, human capital in the government. And they are at the core of this uh, government and all those policies and agilities can never succeed unless we have uh, the human capital adaptable, agile, and actually upskilled to the level we expect them for the future. And I believe there are uh, um, you know, specific uh, uh, skills and abilities that were uh, focused on uh, in the, in the part of the, of the, of the, of the uh, philosophy of uh, development uh, in the federal government in the UAE. Now, we have used e-learning platforms before. It was an important element. However, uh, this crisis have made these platforms so important. Uh, and uh, um, let me be transparent and honest. Uh, if, we, if people used it before as one of the tools to, you, to help upskill and learn and uh, 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 develop uh, their capabilities, now it became the main uh, uh, focus of, 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 of tool to use. 
So, um, and to show examples of that without maybe taking a lot of your time is basically um, uh, we have been kicking off, uh, you know, workshops in the government for, for years uh, with this crisis and because of using these e-learning uh, platform that uh, was invested on by the government uh, pre the crisis, uh, the audience to these, uh, you know, uh, uh, sessions have, have uh, became so successful uh, in a very, very, very uh, uh, happy way. I mean, uh, we have had, like, for example, sessions attended by 18,000 people. Uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, these, these, these kind of tools have helped us in the UAE to utilize uh, our technology and the investment that we made uh, to progress into the future. I don't know, I uh, think that uh, I was asked to just uh, summarize in three, two minutes, so I will leave maybe room if you don't mind for the questions, unless uh, you want to direct me to continue, Dr. Yassar. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Abdul Rahman, and I, I uh, appreciate that. I'm going to quickly invite uh, Jeff to jump in. I mean, Jeff, somebody with your experience and exposure, mm -hmm. I think the only question that I could pose is what's on your mind and what innovations have you seen going on now? We're looking forward to hear from you. Well, thank you very much. Um, as all of you have said, this has been an extraordinary test of governments all over the world, of their logistics, their law, their handling of finance, their ability to maintain public trust, to deal with uncertain science. And we have seen that those governments which allowed their capacity to thin or wane have paid a high price in the last few months and will pay a high price in the rest of the year. I, for me, the most interesting innovations of the crisis are really ones about how governments use intelligence, how they think. And I think they're beginning to think in very novel ways, which have big implications for the future. We can see that, and Huda mentioned this, around data. Some governments, particularly in East Asia, using mobile phone data, credit card data, tracing app data, test data, and also beginning to use data about things like mental health to get a real-time picture of what is happening. Uh, and there have been big advances compared to even a year ago in that respect. The use of models, the fact that there are explicit models about how the pandemic might spread and its economic implications is a big step forward. And in some countries, like Germany, the scientists simultaneously advising the government, but also speaking to the public and acknowledging that science is complex and sometimes contradictory. Again, I feel we've seen a, a movement of science in policy in the last two months, which otherwise might have taken uh, 10 years. We've seen much more systematic orchestration of evidence about what works because every country is looking at every other country uh, to learn from them. And as several people said, the need for much more rapid and agile experimentation, including particularly around lockdowns and escape from lockdowns, an experiment which has to be finely tuned to different industries, different workspaces, uh, and different, uh, different neighborhoods. Uh, and here too, we see a way government could work in the future. For me, the crucial aspect of this is that where these have worked best, they've been organized almost as a public good, as a commons, relatively openness on the data, on the models, on the experiments, on the evidence. Where things haven't worked well is where governments have tried to keep it secret and proprietary. I think the really big challenge for governments, though, in the next period uh, is partly a challenge around the data, because data is so powerful when you link it together, you need new ways of assuring the public that that data will not be abused, misused. So we will need, I think, much, much stronger governance of data to get the full benefits of smarter government. We certainly need new skills inside government because most governments do not have the ability to link these different kinds of intelligence into a, a real system, much more like the brain in the metaphor uh, I would use. And, and some are not really at even the starting point in being, being able to do that. And then finally, I think there's a really exciting opportunity for a new kind of partnership between governments and society. So some of these platforms are being almost co-run by the state and citizens. In this country, for example, one I was involved in called Good Sam has three quarters of a million people volunteering for the health service through a platform, which in a way is a joint government civil society initiative. All over the world, there are similar ones 
uh, organizing care for the elderly or food distribution, or for that matter, mobilizing collective intelligence to design protective equipment for health workers, or for that matter, to come up with new treatments for COVID-19. And again, these point to a future vision of society, uh, of government, which is much smarter in orchestrating intelligence of all kinds, but much more time is doing that in a very open way jointly with society, almost the opposite of the old model of intelligence, which was a security service uh, sucking up information into itself and giving nothing back. And my guess is by the end of the year, the governments which have done best in handling the crisis and the economic ramifications of the crisis will be the ones which are most capable in all of these methods. Thank you, Jeff. That's, that's a brilliant way of, and, and very, very efficient way of summarizing a lot of big ideas i think you uh, i'm going to circle back to you after we hear from you on the issue of of how the governments use the word intelligence government intelligence and that has some connotations in people's minds uh, it's been brilliant working for us people gave government leeway to use this data they've experimented the whole society worked together but moving forward when the crisis goes away will the people still give government that leeway to experiment trial and error use that intelligence are we is there a way of rewiring this trust fabric so i'm going to circle back but i you know i've left your to the last but by absolutely no means least because we have it, we would love to hear your thoughts your on on these on these matters and and maybe i'll come back to you as well to reflect on this issue of national local i know you've been doing a lot of great work at the city level so your please go ahead Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yassar, um, and uh, thanks for, for having me here. This is such an interesting conversation. Um, I, um, I you know, fully subscribe to the notion that public governance is more important than ever. I think it was always important, but I think more people realize it now. And, uh, and innovation at the core of government, as you have pointed out, is, uh, is extremely important. And um, you know, it's no longer innovation by choice, but innovation by necessity. And when we talk about innovation, uh, you know, I'd like to kind of clarify how I interpret the term. I think it's never innovation for innovation's sake. It's innovation to make governments more effective, better able to tackle problems, more efficient, better able to save resources, equitable, better able to do justice to individuals and groups, uh, more responsive, better able to hear people and engage with the community, and uh, more resilience, uh, better able to keep going. Uh, so when you think about those core uh, responsibilities of government and core values that underlie public governance, it's really interesting to see how COVID-19 has forced um, governments all over the world to do more of it. I'll be talking a little bit about uh, the American perspective, not because I'm American, I'm originally from the Netherlands, but that's where I live and do most of my research and teaching, uh, it, particularly in the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, where we work with over uh, 300 cities that we have convened over the past three months on a weekly basis uh, to uh, facilitate learning uh, from city to city. And I think uh, the notion that uh, uh, Her Excellency Huda uh, introduced about agility and uh, the way the UAE government has basically put a lot of focus on government acceleration, uh, iteration, experimentation, cross-boundary learning in real time, um, I think is a really important notion. And that's what we're seeing uh, here in the United States as cities figure out a way uh, to learn forward through this crisis. Uh, there are no clear-cut solutions. There are no uh, definitive answers. We're all learning in real time. And I think uh, what we're seeing here, the biggest governance level innovation is that um, there's a, a movement of bottom-up governance where we see more horizontal relationships between cities uh, who are, you know, let's be honest, in the absence of leadership from the federal government and a coordinated effort, figuring it out in real time together. And so I think a lot of interesting things on the five dimensions that I just uh, pointed out, um, you know, can be observed. Uh, first of all, effective, um, you know, all about, you know, the, the, the importance of tackling problems. Well, the problems have just gotten bigger. All the problems that we had have just gotten bigger. Inequality is deepening. Uh, poverty is uh, increasing uh, with the recession. And also, also social unrest is uh, is is increasing, and uh, some of the innovations that we're seeing that um, uh, cities uh, are taking is that they are much more 
proactive and agile in uh, implementing testing, tracing, and supported isolation, which is the emerging model uh, for uh, keeping the virus in a box, so to speak. And so uh, they realize that there are regional effects and you cannot, uh, you know, unless you keep your population in lockdown forever, uh, you will have to adapt to uh, the fact that people uh, travel and that the virus travels. And therefore, uh, the way uh, cities, uh, before the federal government even uh, was at that point, started adopting testing, tracing, and supported isolation practices and implementing metrics that would inform when to close, when to reopen, and when to reclose again. Uh, so that's a, a, an inspiring innovation because it's a really an example of agile governance. Uh, on the second dimension, efficiency, um, uh, how to do uh, more with less. Well, that has just become more important because there are fewer resources. Uh, municipal finance is in a, in a huge crisis and we see that, um, uh, you know, uh, that forces uh, cities to kind of rethink their uh, their uh, their budgets and um, you know the the confluence of the crisis around policing in the United States uh, and the pandemic has some has led some mayors to rethink how to allocate resources for law enforcement. Some are uh, advocating for defunding the police uh, or abandoning it altogether, but uh, many are. Uh, really focused on thinking what are some of the tasks that police doesn't necessarily have to do but the community could be engaged in doing. It's the old idea of community policing but in a very new context and uh, rethinking about how to allocate public resources there is, is a source of creativity and innovation. Uh, then on the focus of equity, uh, as I said, there's more inequality and some of the innovations uh, that we've seen, some very minor but important ne nevertheless, is uh, different uh, office hours for seniors. So those that are most vulnerable and ex uh, when exposed to the virus uh, could have uh, you know, more uh, preferred treatments, uh, getting earlier to shops, getting earlier to government services uh, so that uh, those who are uh, most vulnerable are most protected. Um, we also see jobs for the unemployed. Uh, contact tracing is a job now. Uh, so people uh, who have lost their jobs, particularly in low income, uh, low income communities, are being uh, trained to be a, a disease detective, uh, which uh, provides them with employment, but also helps mitigate the virus spread. And then on the notion of responsiveness, uh, governments need to be more responsive than ever. Um, there is more unrest and more concern and more anxiety uh, in many communities about how this is all gonna play out. And we've seen mayors uh, reinvent their public uh, engagements um, and creating virtual town halls, uh, Zoom calls, uh, all these things that uh, some people thought would never happen are accelerating right now. And then finally, on the point of resilience, um, there is more uncertainty than ever before. And so, um, you know, the innovations that are taking place there is that uh, mayors are adopting new ways uh, to uh, uh, work with scenario planning and contingency management, uh, not just with regards to public ordinances, uh, you know, on reopening and closing, but also uh, with regards to their finances and uh, thinking about multiple scenarios. And that again is, uh, I think, a, a really great example of agile, experimental, uh, and cross-boundary uh, governance. So I think uh, what national governments can learn from this is, is also important. Um, the more uncertainties there are and the more contingencies involved in public policy and management, uh, the more uh, pressure there will be on a national government to have a model that quickly becomes too complex. And so if you uh, elevate the importance and the capability and mobilize local governance to work not in, uh, in a vertical relationship with federal government or national government, but uh, actively facilitate and empower horizontal governance where uh, local uh, and state uh, governments and provincial governments can work together on a much more structural basis uh, in a much more agile way that actually uh, helps federal government focus on the things that only federal governments can do. So let me stop there. Thank you very much, Jared. You've given us a lot of great examples to think about from, from uh, disease detectives to senior office hours to uh, 
funding the police or not funding them uh, for that matter, um, and the bottom-up governance issue. So, gentlemen, there's a lot of questions I have. There's a lot of questions coming in, but unfortunately, as I mentioned early on, we have very limited time. So I'm going to give you the challenge of the two and a half minute question each, uh, because uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman, people are very keen to know about the future of HR. Is remote work a thing? Will we be able to adapt? You mentioned AI that triggered some people's interest. Will we be able to use technology to make remote work a core feature of government? Uh, or is it a matter of crisis is over, back to normal? And um, very quickly, I'll, I'll raise my hand when the time is over, but I'm going to also look to Jeff to say, Jeff, this whole issue of trust, people are talking about trust in government. Will government be able to continue to do this? Some people are asking you specifically, saying, you know, some governments have been opened by good intention, uh, well-intentioned uh, open data they should. Some governments have been burnt by it and uncomfortable. And, you know, so while it's good intention to open, some it, it, it sort of affected them negatively. And you know, the question that came to you as well specifically will come back is, Will risk management become much more prominent at the core of government? Seems people don't think risk management has been a, a core feature of government's core work. Will this be integrated more? And specifically when we talk up the bottom up because you're closer to the issues. So Dr. Abdelrahman, please start us off with this round of, uh, and I'm, I'm sorry we don't have enough time to get even so more thank on you. this, please. Actually in the UAE government, the uh, remote working is not uh, uh, something that just happened because of COVID-19. Uh, pilots were kicked off in 2017, and uh, uh, two pilots with different uh, sets of, uh, of groups of entities and such a group of jobs, and they were very successful. Hence, what COVID-19 has done is accelerated the policy that was just approved in March by the UAE federal government of remote working as a, a, an integral uh, policy of, of uh, human capital policy in the, in the UAE federal government. And in this policy, it regulates how the remote working will continue after COVID-19. Uh, we look at it as an opportunity, as I mentioned. It's not uh, uh, something that we were forced to do. Actually, in the UAE government, we looked at it as an opportunity because it convinced us that there's a greater opportunity to study even if there is any fine tuning that we need to do. And we did that. And I was uh, answering, or maybe in, in my previous comment that I made, there is, there is an interlink with uh, productivity and efficiency of the government. And I believe without having digital solutions that will allow the governments to measure the efficiency of the uh, government, I don't think it will be a, a successful model. And hence, in the UAE government, there was a, an investment in pilots, as I mentioned, pre-COVID-19 and using digital solutions and AI-powered productivity solutions to allow us to utilize these to enable us to understand the triggers that will help us to enhance the efficiency of the government, whether they are remote, the employees are remotely working or they are working in the, in the, uh, in the uh, office space, uh, office place. And, and I believe in the UAE government, we have utilized this, as I mentioned, to accelerate certain policies along the lines of not to go back to uh, the uh, previous norm because we believe that the philosophy was already uh, agreed by the leadership and the uh, UAE government. The timing was great, uh, and I'm sorry to use great <laughs> in, uh, in, in uh, the circumstances of, of COVID, but the COVID-19 have presented us an opportunity to kick off and, and, and accelerate these uh, policies. So the, maybe in a short, in short uh, answer, um, in the UAE, we believe it is, it's going to become a norm, a type of jobs that will, uh, will, will, will be defined. There are core knowledge employees, there are support employees, there are other functions, and, and this is the sort of uh, criteria and the processes that are addressed in this policy that was approved by the UAE government. And the, the, the digital solutions that I was discussing is a great element to help and support us in managing this successfully. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Jeff, going back to this issue of data and experimentation and trust. So we, we say in Britain often necessity is the mother of invention, and there's been a lot of necessity and a lot of invention. I think some of that has been in how governments communicate. So more than ever before, governments 
daily press conferences setting clear the facts but also the uncertainties. On the data side, countries like Taiwan and New Zealand have been very open with data but also open about the limits of data and trying to improve them. We've seen extraordinary innovation around things like obviously financial support but also problem solving. In this country, my country, street homelessness was eliminated almost immediately because of the crisis where it hadn't been uh, for ages. And my family is originally from New Zealand. I do think Jacinda Ardern there has been a model of how government should be, that you can be strong and compassionate at the same time. You can be very clear, but also very honest about the uncertainties at the same time. And that's the kind of model which seems to build trust more than anything else. Thank you very much for this, Jeff. And, and you absolutely, you pinpointed the, the necessity and we hope that uh, we're learning a lot of lessons. Thank you for mentioning Jacinda as well, because I think with every crisis, she, she gains more fans with this, this absolute fantastic combination of using you know, power, soft power, data, but still building trust at the same time. And you're at this issue of risk management, which probably local governments are better at because they're closer to the uh, front line. Are we going to see, you know, sticking to our subject of this uh, webinar, more risk management, more structured, data-driven, you know, private sector like to speak at the core of government practices? Well, I, I certainly hope so. Um, it's, it's been a, a focus of um, the, the public uh, sector innovation community for a long time, this notion of uh, predictive analytics uh, so that you can, uh, you know, help um, uh, people who are at risk or in need um, uh, proactively uh, so that you can spot uh, law enforcement challenges uh, proactively and deploy the limited resources of government there where uh, uh, you get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, the biggest challenges to uh, uh, that type of work, uh, risk scores and predictions than a little uh, that there is a reluctance to uh, use all the data that government has uh, because there are concerns about uh, privacy and um, and also about racial profiling and so uh, those are real concerns I think uh, the uh, silo uh, mentality is uh, quickly changing because uh, under the pressure of this crisis uh, as uh, many of the previous speakers pointed out uh, you know, innovation takes uh, place uh, across boundaries and everybody realizes a more holistic approach to solving our problems today is necessary. Uh, I think uh, the debate about uh, competing values, uh, uh, making sure that um, we uh, don't turn into a gigantic surveillance society uh, is, is, is really important. And I think, uh, you know, as much as there are technical challenges in this crisis, I think the um, uh, rethinking of the social compact and uh, the you know, sometimes competing or conflicting values uh, that are underlying our public management efforts, uh, you know, are, are really coming to the fore. And I think it's, it's upon all of us as uh, citizens, but uh, particularly on public leaders, uh, to, um, you know, facilitate and orchestrate a conversation where we don't shy away from discussing those values, uh, but uh, actually lean in and make sure that we don't uh, face trade-offs only, but where we uh, innovate in a way that we can both protect um, privacy, uh, confidentiality, equity, justice, as well as uh, create more uh, effective risk management practices and more efficient uh, allocation of resources. Brilliant. I think that's a very, very nice way of to conclude our panel in terms of our collective responsibility as well to lean in and try to, to make some of these things uh, happen. So before we thank everybody and before we sort of just say thank you and a few concluding remarks, we want to test out the technology. We have 570 experts with us that are on the Zoom. There's other watching on YouTube and others, but at least on Zoom. We want to run a quick poll to see if people can help us think through two questions. Uh, by joining our movement. Of course, you can always continue this conversation, listen to the great stuff our Global Innovation Council has on the website. But we want to run a quick poll to think about two things. One is the question about what are the, what's, what's most under, under pressure now? What do you think the one area that is under the maximum amount of pressure given the crisis? And hence, probably the area that will have the most change. Please click, submit your answer, and we'll see some results.
And by way of continuing the conversation as well, uh, uh, see if we can pop up the results or we can share them online. I wanted to also, uh, uh, the team wanted to also pick your brains on, you know, this is the Global Innovation Council trying to push for more innovative governments, trying to share more innovations around the world and trying to make governments more agile, responsive. Um, and if we wanted to continue having these conversations, whether it's online, whether it's on the website, uh, um, a question we had as well we wanted to pull in is what are the uh, what could be another uh, another set of topics that the council could probably uh, discuss moving forward what are the things you would like to most hear of let's see if the technology will work with us again for this and just before i move on to the next question it looks like policy making seems to be the area where most people think is the pressure the fast rapid stuff that rodney talked about making faster decisions, making faster policies. And I mentioned more speed, less haste. We need more data, more analytics. And secondly, obviously, uh, human resource management. And you know, I think we all are split camps between wanting to see more remote work or less remote work. But uh, that seems to be, these seem to be the east, more areas we see the most. And of course, budgeting, whether flexibility and agility comes. Let's move to the next question and try to see what kind of topics you would like to engage in moving forward with the Global Innovation Council should you attend some of these sessions. Um, please click on the topics you think are most interesting, whether it's technology, global collaboration, climate change, and so on. I would like to click all, but I think you're only allowed to click one. So be, uh, until we get the results for that, I wanna first of all thank our speakers very much. First of all, for their very valuable insights, for being able to share some of these insights in such a condensed matter of time, but this is the nature of the speedy world we live in. Uh, I'm taking away a few things. Uh, COVID has been a force multiplier to some great ideas. So we had some great ideas, innovations. We wanted to push them out. It's been a force multiplier to push them all out, but it's also allowing us to sit back a little bit, if we can catch a breath, and rethink, rewire, look at things as like bottom-up government governance. Uh, this issue of collective work, whole society governance, uh, collaboration across nations. And I hope there's a lot of lessons for us to use, not just for this pandemic, but for the many challenges we face around the world. And agility seems to be the name of the game moving forward. Um, future readiness, let's see what people seem to be keen on technology. So we want to see more technology, which brings me nicely to the point I wanted to raise about agility. Moving forward to be agile, you need to invest more in data. Data is going to be the name of the game moving forward for the many years to come. Data, technology, but not just by way of infrastructure, but by way of skills. Jeff mentioned the ability to upskill, reskill. Rodney mentioned that in the government of Canada. Huda mentioned how the UE is investing a lot in reskilling and upskilling. So probably technology, data, and skills is where we'll probably end this on because they're the secret source for agility. Again, I want to thank everybody, uh, all our great speakers uh, for their time. I want to thank everybody who joined us uh, live on Zoom or by YouTube, and I definitely look forward to our next uh, GIC meeting where we share some of these uh, thoughts with us. Thank you.